Uh, any uh, doctors who um, are attending this that are inclined to, to join the National Catholic Medical Association, we have a local guild here that we are trying to be chartered. Um, I'm put to shame by the Kalamazoo and the uh, Grand Rapids group, which has already reached their minimum six active physicians that have joined both the local and national uh, level. So um, I need people to step up and to take leadership roles. Uh, any position is available. You want to be president, vice president, secretary, or treasurer. Uh, we have a handful of people that are, are, are working on this. And, but as Father Boris said yesterday, Christ needs help to fight the battles, the war for which he has already won. And so uh, that's my plea is to please um, help us in uh, putting on these programs. We do it every year, and we appreciate it. I'm going to introduce our, our next speaker. Mr. Leonard Nelson is a professor at the Cumberland School of Law at Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. Mr. Nelson received a Bachelor of Arts degree, magna cum laude, from the University of Washington, a Juris Doctor degree cum laude from Gonzaga University, and a Master of Laws degree from Yale University. Mr. Nelson, Nelson is the author of the book, Diagnosis Critical, The Urgent Threats Confronting Catholic Healthcare, and has published numerous law magazine and peer-reviewed articles and book reviews. His legal career has taken him across the country, from California to Washington, and now Alabama, and now here in Detroit. Please welcome Mr. Nelson. Can everybody hear me? Is that loud enough? Okay, I'll try to use my classroom voice to project here. It's a pleasure to be with you. I know a lot of you have to catch a plane, so I'm going to move through these slides pretty quickly. Uh, I don't want to give you indigestion. But I'm going to talk about the uh, threat to Catholic health care and try to make a case why we need these alternative models. So maybe I'm preaching to the choir, but uh, sometimes it's good to reiterate some of this information. Okay, um, well that's my book there. Whoops, back. Uh, Diagnosis Critical was published in June 2009, so it was right before we entered into health care reform. Uh, at the time it was they talked about the urgent threats confronting Catholic health care, and that was summer 2009. I think the threats have become, if anything, more urgent since then. Uh, here's the statement of the problem that I set forth in my book. Uh, this contemporary struggle between the culture of life and the culture of death. Catholic hospitals traditionally have been a bastion for preservation of the, Catholic, of the culture of life, but they're in danger due to a confluence of powerful environmental forces, cultural, religious, economic, and political forces, seem to be working in tandem to erode the identity of Catholic hospitals. So that was my basic thesis. What was the reaction? This is kind of interesting. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. But I was interviewed by Nancy Fraser O'Brien from Catholic News Service. And you ever get a sense when you're being interviewed that the reporter's a little bit hostile? <laughs> well, that was my experience. And sure enough, as soon as she got off the phone with me, she placed a call to Sister Carol Kean to ask her what she thought of my book. Now, Sister Carol Kean had not read my book, but she didn't like it, and she made it very clear. And she said, well, this is just an old thesis that reappears every five to ten years. Well, I did not get a call back from Nancy Fraser O'Brien to respond to Sister Carol Kean, not surprisingly. And then there was a book review. I have to tell you the truth, I was surprised that they reviewed it in the Health Progress. I thought they would ignore it. But uh, Monsignor Worsley, who I don't know, uh, did interview it. And uh, if you've looked at my book, you know I have a lot of footnotes in there. Well, why all the footnotes? Well, I guess I was prepared to be attacked, so I wanted to be sure I thoroughly documented everything I said. So if somebody was going to review it, they couldn't say, well, I made a mistake here and a mistake there. I didn't want to have to deal with that. So his, his uh, review, I thought, was pretty straightforward. And he said, basically, what my, one of my central theses was, was that uh, the only guarantor of Catholic identity in the U.S. is an adherence to the ERDs as interpreted and applied by the local bishop. So that was the central theme of my book. 
Um, he went on to say, and this is true, that I'm concerned about Catholic identity and perhaps it would be better to divert resources of Catholic health care to alternative ministries. And we've talked about some of those. And I didn't go into the details of how to go about this. This conference has helped to flesh that out. Then he went on and said, well, you know, this focus on ERDs, that's too narrow. He says, I find his criteria for determining Catholic identity to be unhelpfully narrow. Many of the founders of Catholic hospitals believed the provision of competent, compassionate care to the poor and marginalized to be an essential element of Catholic health care. I, I concur with that completely. I think that is the central element, and I didn't in any way denigrate that in my book. It is certainly an element under every bit as much pressure today as those focused upon in this book. I agree with that too. But I think his central point was I focus too much on the ER duties. And that was the problem he had with my book. Now this to me is a very disturbing picture. Okay? This is health care reform. It's been announced. The hospitals are asked to put $155 billion on the table. And we don't know at this point in time what the conscience protection is going to be. Or the protection against abortion funding. But look who's in the forefront here. Okay, we've got our elected Catholic public officials are appointed. We've got Vice President Biden, pro-choice. Secretary Sebelius, Catholic, pro-choice. We have Sister Carol Keehan, head of the Catholic Health Association. And at the podium is Richard Humdenstock, who's actually head of the American Hospital Association, but was previously head of Providence Health Services, or Providence Health System in Spokane, Washington, my hometown. So you have some pretty important, significant Catholic figures coming forward at the beginning, supporting health care reform, before we really have any guarantees at all about what's going to be in there in terms of conscience protection or protection against abortion funding. Contrast the approach of the CHA with the Catholic Medical Association. Okay? CMA certainly is concerned about social justice, but not to the extent it overrides traditional moral values. They've pinpointed the problem as the influence of the culture of death, and they've called for decentralized market-based solutions. This was back in 2004, as opposed to a statist approach or an expansion of government. Now, what's the problem with the expansion of government? Well, if you are living in a culture of death, Expanding government power over health care doesn't seem to me to be a good idea if you're concerned about preserving the identity of Catholic health care institutions. That poses a significant danger. Okay, so, will the distinctive Catholic hospital survive? Well, we now have the ACA. I think that increases pressure on Catholic hospitals that want to preserve their distinctive character. Now, you have heroic people like Gene Diamond and his system. What's the ACA? That's the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Obamacare. We have consolidations of health care providers and health plans increasing. That puts additional pressure on. A lot of mergers, a lot of consolidations going on. My hometown, there's a Catholic hospital and a very close relationship with this large clinic sitting right down below their hospital. Biggest clinic in the area. Uh, the competitor hospital in town, which had been a Protestant hospital historically, had been purchased by a for-profit plan. They came into town and putting significant money into the competitor hospital, but they also bought the clinic, which is the biggest clinic in the area, right from under the nose of the Catholic hospital. So now all those referrals are going to the for-profit hospital. So that's where you're going to see more and more, more consolidation, more mergers. Financial pressures and need for greater access to capital markets to prepare for all this. You've got to have money to set up ACOs, significant resources. Okay. So you need access to capital markets for that. Now what happens if all this cost containment stuff and the legislation doesn't work? Now, in my more paranoid moments, I think this was
was a plan that was devised to fail. It's a ticking time bomb. It's not going to work. And that people that devised it actually knew that it wasn't going to work. Cost containment's not going to work. So what's going to happen when the cost containment falls apart? And maybe the individual mandate being invalidated, I don't like the individual mandate, but that, that may make the cost situation worse. So what happens when cost containment doesn't work, when the costs start going through the roof, when employers maybe start dumping their employees on the health insurance exchanges because it's cheaper? When the cost of individual policies available on the exchange skyrocket, as they have in Massachusetts, well, guess what? Somebody's going to say Medicare for all, right? Single payer. That'll be the solution to talk. Just a possibility. I say we either we're probably either going to go that route, or if we're lucky, we'll go to the route of devolving power to the states, which I would prefer. You know, block grant Medicare and Medicaid, give it to the states and let them do it. But a lot depends on the next election as to how that plays out. A lot, that's the Paul Ryan plan that I'm, I'm talking about. A lot depends on the next election. So that could all lead to greater government control. Obviously, you go single payer, you go Medicare for all, then the government's, the federal government's in charge of everything, basically. So that could happen. Okay, so I'm going to look at some threats to Catholic identity. One of them is an external threat. I'm just going to talk briefly about conscience protection. You've already talked quite a bit about that. But then I'm going to talk about some internal threats. This notion that social justice trumps traditional morality, perhaps a coming shift to for-profit health care. Now, I'm not saying for-profit is necessarily bad, but I'm concerned about the direction that it's taking with these large systems. And this disparity in interpreting the ERDs. So I'll talk about each one of those. Are we losing the battle for institutional conscience protection? Well, it doesn't look really good right now. And for one thing, institutional conscience protection is more problematic in our legal culture. Traditionally, we focused on constitutional protection for individuals, not so much for institutions like hospitals. And that problem is exacerbated by the fact that now our hospitals are even more dependent on government funding. also problematic because of disparate views of what conscience is. And the Catholic view is different than the secular view. Secular view is it's kind of an idiosyncrasy, a psychological sort of thing, based on your own life experiences. It's not based on objective moral truth. Very different view of conscience. Here's James Childress, noted in bioethicist. What does he say? Conscience is personal and subjective. It's a person's consciousness of and reflection on his own acts in relation to his standards of judgment. It's a first person claim. Deriving from standards that he may or may not apply to the conduct of others. It's an idiosyncrasy. Contrast that with the Catholic view. Practical judgment involving application of the precepts of natural law to a particular situation premised on the existence of objective moral norms. Very different views of what conscience is. We also have the problem that in a contemporary secular liberal democracy, ethical relativism, excuse me, ethical relativism is the prevailing public philosophy. So when you appeal to conscience based on objective moral truth, People look at you very strangely, or maybe they get angry. Okay. Maybe they get hostile. Some view refusal by Catholic hospitals to provide access to reproductive health services as narrow-minded and mean-spirited. <laughs> That's because contraception and abortion are now recognized as fundamental rights even by many of our Catholic politicians. They view access to abortion as a fundamental right. They think it ought to be funded by the state. And 
And here's John Paul II on ethical relativism, ethical relativism as a condition, viewed as a condition of essential, essential condition of democracy. It guarantees tolerance, mutual respect, acceptance decision of the majority. Whereas moral norms considered to be objective and binding are held to be, lead to authoritarianism and intolerance. That's not his view, that's the prevailing ethos out there. Ethical relativism is good. Truth, claims of truth based on objective moral norms is bad. That's the contemporary view. Veritatis Splendor, he noted that the alliance between ethical relativism and liberal democracy has the potential to remove any sure moral reference point from political and social life, and on a deeper level, make the acknowledgement of truth impossible. So these are some of the cultural trends we're dealing with. When you have a Catholic hospital that's receiving large amounts of government money and purports to be a community hospital, these are hard claims to make, the claim to be exempt from requirements that you provide abortions, so-called reproductive health services. Right? And that argument's undermined if the hospital's already trying to figure out some way to provide those services, which many of them are. Some of them are already providing them directly in the hospital, or entering into kind of complex and nuanced arrangements with other providers to offer the services. So if you're trying, if you're doing that and trying to make truth claims based on objective moral norms, it's, it's an incoherent message. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit about social justice. Now, social justice, I know that's part of our Catholic tradition. There are some good points to it. But I'm very concerned about this notion of social justice sort of devoid of objective moral norms. And we, of course, saw the Catholic Health Association. They supported Obamacare based on social justice. They disagreed with the bishops as to whether there were adequate conscience protection and restrictions on federal abortion financing and legislation. And my concern is that social justice is just going to overwhelm everything else. It just leads to rejection of traditional moral norms. Tristram Englehart, who's uh, a character for those of you who know him, but I think he has a good point here. If we start talking about social justice, as Catholic Health Association has, that can backfire. Because in our society, Social justice is going to be translated as a plea for universal access to abortion. I mean, if you already accept the notion that abortion is a fundamental right, and you have somebody talking about social justice and health care, it's not much of a leap to say, well, okay, that ought to include access to abortion. Really ought to include government funding. So social justice is a little bit problematic. Now, here's Hayek. Now, I'm not a libertarian. I'm a Burkean conservative. But I've been reading Hayek lately, and he makes more sense all the time. Uh, he, was, he was there in England when they were putting together the welfare state, so he had some concerns about what was going on there. And a friend of mine, I was telling him I was really troubled by the, notion, the use that the Catholic Health Association was, made, was making of this notion of social justice. He said, oh, you need to read Hayek. So he directed me to this passage. And here's what Hayek had to say way back in the 40s. I believe that social justice will ultimately be recognized as a will of the wisp which has lured men to abandon many of the values which have inspired the development of civilization. Like most attempts to pursue an unattainable goal, the striving for it will also produce highly undesirable consequences and in particular lead to the destruction of the un indispensable environment in which traditional moral values can flourish, namely personal freedom. Seems to be pretty, pretty profound. Okay, what about the Faustine bargain? Did the leadership of the CHA re 
accept reductions in future Medicare payments and compromise their independence from government control with the hope of being relieved of the burden of providing uncompensated care? How will the reduction in uncompensated care ultimately impact their nonprofit status? For years, for profit hospitals said you don't need to have nonprofit tax exempt hospitals. They're not doing any more charity care than the for profit. And they've got some data to back them up on that. Now, Jean's Hospital is doing a lot, but there's other systems that aren't doing it. Senator Grassley held some hearings not long ago on nonprofit. And he was very troubled <laughs> by the lack of charity care and about the aggressive enforcement. If somebody couldn't pay their bill, some of these systems really went after them. Okay? So yeah, now that you're not doing any uncompensated, the government's going to pay for all everybody's care. Why have nonprofit tax exempt hospitals? So here's the most recent development a for-profit joint venture between Ascension Health and a private equity firm. Now, where is this going? I don't know for sure. I'm not an insider. But it doesn't seem inconceivable to me that this might result in all your, so your profitable hospitals being spun off to the for-profit venture and closure of your unprofitable facilities. Okay? The ones that might provide services to illegal immigrants, for example. I don't know for sure, but this, this is an interesting development in conjunction with health care reform. This is Joe Carlson from Modern Healthcare. Care. Here's a, a quote from Kathleen Boozang, whom I don't always agree with, but I, I think she has a valid point here. Can a for-profit enterprise owned by a private equity firm pursue and live the ministry of Jesus in providing health care? Now, the claim of Catholic Health Association and Ascension is, well, these things are going to be Catholic. Of course, they're going to adhere to the ERDs, I assume as interpreted by, <coughs> not, not so much by the local bishop. But what's going to happen to these non-producing hospitals, these ones that are not making money. If you're for profit, you're in the business to make money. You're, you're going to close them. They're going to be gone. Okay, another problem inconsistent interpretation of the ERDs. It seems to me that a lot of Catholic systems have this idea that they're the ones that interpret the ERDs, not the local bishop. And of course, at the same time, they always offer social justice up as a justification when they seek to get involved in cooperative arrangements that provide sterilization and abortion. And, of course, the Caritas Christi case is an interesting one. We know how that ends. Eventually, Caritas Christi was sold uh, to a for-profit venture. Okay? But this was back when they were trying to decide what to do because they were apparently not sustainable financially. So at one point, they were going to try to they tried to enter in a joint venture. And of course, Caritas Christi is a Catholic hospital chain in Massachusetts. And they were going to try to provide health insurance under the Commonwealth Care Plan, which is a Massachusetts plan for low-income residents. And they were, it was approved. Connector, which is the, kind of the health exchange, named for the health insurance exchange in Massachusetts, approved it. They said, you go ahead. They had a lot of... Uh, debate about it, though, because one concern is, well, now this Catholic hospital is involved in this for-profit venture with, with uh, another entity. Are they going to limit access to reproductive health services? So they had quite a debate about that. And Cardinal Malley said, well, you know, he wasn't persuaded that this was uh, consistent with the ER days. He was going to block it. He says, well, of course, this is a good thing to serve the poor, but it can't trump, social justice can't trump the ERDs. Now, here's the minutes from the connector. And they're discussing, well, are they going to be able to provide reproductive health services or not? And you can see what they say. They've, they're satisfied that uh, they're going to do everything they need to do to give ready access 
to reproductive health services, including abortion. They're going to staff a, a line 24 hours a day to provide referrals. And they've made that commitment. So that's why they got approved by the connector. And here's the coverage of the plan. Okay? Where you can get an abortion, it's only 50 bucks. Maternity and family planning doesn't cost you anything. So this is the plan that was going to be offered, the self-care plan, by Caritas Christie, along with this for-profit. And here's the criticism, okay? Here's Todd Salzman at the theology, in the theology department at Creighton. And he's, he doesn't like uh, Cardinal O'Malley's approach. He said that would be scandalous if, if Caritas wasn't allowed to participate in offering this plan. That would be scandalous because of social justice. Now remember, this is a for-profit plan, right? They're going to make money on it. That's why they're going into it. Okay. But they're offering social justice up as the reason for ignoring these traditional restrictions on facilitating access to abortion. And here's Sister Carol Keehan. says, nobody's more attentive to life issues than the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston. And she goes on to say about this deal, Caritas has done more than one would usually see to avoid being involved with abortion and other services opposed by the Catholic Church. Okay. As I look at the way Caritas Christi has structured this arrangement, it allows them to be participants with the state in the care of the poor and the most vulnerable citizens for the state of Massachusetts in a way that brings the richness of their system and the caring nature of that system to the poor without in any way violating any of the religious directives. Now remember, this plan is providing abortion for a $50 copay. They're staffing a line 24 hours a day to provide abortion referrals. Family planning services, zero dollars out of pocket. And they're making money on it. Okay? And here's what Kathleen Kevin says. Well, the criticism of this deal is a reflection of an increasingly absolutist and abortion movement in the United States. For some of these pro-life groups, no cooperation with evil is ever justified. But that's more of a prophetic stance, a new way of applying the tradition. We're the innovators. Right? Well, fortunately, Cardinal O'Malley nixed the deal, right? Again, eventually it was sold to for-profit with some guarantees that at least an attempt to preserve Catholic identity. Okay, then there's the Phoenix case. And I wrote an article in the OSB News Weekly about this. Um, the response of CHW to Bishop Olmsted's decree is disconcerting. They rejected any implication of wrongdoing with respect to the abortion and indicated that they would not change any of their policies, operations, or procedures. Moreover, the CHA issued a press release with a, sta with a statement by Sister Carol Kia, CEO, supporting St. Joseph's action and characterizing the abortion as permissible. Now, I haven't had access to the medical records in. I'm not sure Sister Carol Kia did either. I suspect she did. Or HIPAA might have been violated. That's not There's also a HIPAA protection here that you have to be concerned about. So she's, I assume, going on the word of the folks at St. Joseph. I go on, the litmus test for determining whether a hospital is Catholic is whether it adheres to the ARDs as interpreted by the local bishop. It's the bishop that's responsible for authoritative interpretations of the moral law. That's the role of the bishop as successor of the apostles. Defiance of Bishop Olmsted's authority sets a dangerous precedent. If Catholic hospitals are no longer subject to supervision of local bishops to ensure their adherence to the ERDs, then we are on the verge of a massive change to Catholic life in America. And here's Scott Alessi as a follow-up. I don't know whether this was a reaction to my comments, but there was an interchange, an exchange between Sister Carol and Archbishop Dolan, and she said that the CHA firmly supported the role of the local bishop. 
as an authentic interpreter of the ERDs. After it belongs the bishop who, prom who adopts the ERDs, the bishop is the one who interprets the ERDs. The bishop can even write, and Sister Carol acknowledges, the bishop can even write his own ERDs. That would be permissible. Oh, here's a further quote suggesting, well, that's a great thing if they're getting along now and they're collaborating with the bishops. That's a very positive sign. But I go on to say a lot depends on follow-up. If you're going to be identified as a Catholic institution, you have got to maintain the link with the bishop. There's going to have to be some sort of accountability and monitoring process put in place to ensure that these institutions are living up to the standards that they are required to live up to. And here's the aftermath. Sister Carolyn told America she, did, she wasn't aware that the uh, USCCB intended to release these letters or write a story about it. She reiterated the main theme of her letter to Dolan, that the CHA has never challenged a local bishop's right to interpret or address ethical and religious directives within his diocese. As she says, the CHA has said that, and always said, the bishop has the right to promulgate the directives and to interpret the ERDs. He can even write his own ERDs if he wants. We have never questioned that, but can we have a difference of opinion? Absolutely. <laughs> she said, part of the mission of the ACHA has been to assist hospitals and U.S. bishops make practical sense of the church's ethical and religious directives. CHA will continue to contribute its reflections and its input on both the pastoral and clinical needs of patients. She acknowledged the right of Bishop Olmsted to kick them out of the diocese. But, she said, she still believed St. Joseph's administrators were properly following Catholic directives in the difficult decision. The hospital remains a CHA member institution. So what can the bishop do? The bishop can say, I no longer recognize you as a Catholic hospital. What's the reaction of the hospital? We're still Catholic. And we reserve the right to interpret the ERDs. We think the bishop's wrong. And what does CHA say? You're still a member. You're still a member of the Catholic Health Association. Okay, conclusion, it's possible. The greatest threat, continuation of distinctively Catholic health care, results not from the frontal assault on conscience protection, but from a process of incremental erosion commitment to the ERDs. Catholic health care institutions will be pressured, enticed into facilitating access to sterilizations and abortion referrals in the name of social justice and for financial reasons. Some profitable Catholic hospitals may be reconfigured as for-profit entities, some unprofitable ones may close. Some Catholic hospitals will continue to enter into complex and nuanced arrangements to provide access to reproductive health services. Some won't even bother doing that. They'll just provide them right in the hospital, particularly sterilizations. If bishops refuse to permit Catholic hospitals to provide access to so-called reproductive health services, some hospitals will continue to call themselves Catholic and interpret Catholic teaching and ERDs by their own lives. So maybe it's time to think about diverting resources to alternative ministries. I'm concerned about acute care Catholic hospitals, the ability to maintain their Catholic identity. And there's some there's some good systems, we know that. But there's a lot of them that aren't aren't very good. And I just mentioned the Fort and Berry Act is a way to facilitate the creation of alternative institutions, particularly alternative health plans. Okay, thank you.
Jack, thank you so much. Um, I just have a couple remarks and then we will adjourn. Uh, I wanted to just, you know, thank Jack. I mean, anybody that doesn't have his book, please get it. There's so much, such a, you know, knowledge in there that we all need to know. And I, I forgot to thank the individual that has taken this conference, um, Christoph Donahue, yes. and uh, Steve Koo of One More Soul uh, for, you know, having taken this. I we'll, we'll have to get some information out to let everybody know that there's tapes available that you can get uh, and use however you want, or if you miss some talks and you want to get one of the tapes. Um, and I want to just uh, reiterate the importance of filling out this conference evaluation. Uh, you know, after what I've heard today and from so many other people uh, and last night that um, we need to do another conference like this next year. And uh, I know we're going to have a lot of activity this year. And uh, I really believe that there's many people here that are going to take what they learn and they're going to link, you know, more with other, you know, individuals in their own states. And uh, we need to get back together again next year, report our progress, and make some uh, goals, you know, for the, for the next year. I mean, this battle is so important, particularly, you know, between now and the end of 2014. And the more we can get engaged, I mean, we might not stop, you know, where a lot of, you know, really evil things are, are going on. But if we can just create an environment, uh, and as Jack said a couple of times, where we have other alternatives. And, uh, you know, we, we know that we can do it for less, uh, but we have to be able to get paid. Uh, anybody that's in the medical profession has to have a way to get paid. So that's why we've got to create new alternatives where we can get paid. But just uh, once again, you know, I want to thank all of you for your commitment, for being here, and for participating in this conference. And again, God bless you all. I don't know if there's anything else I have to tell anybody. John, was there anything else I have to tell anybody about signing anything? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, just uh, pay attention to the Christus Medicus Foundation website. Uh, it's going to take us a little while, but we've gathered a lot of information here. And we're going to update our website. And, um, um, you know, depending on... Uh, you know how much money we we can raise will have a big influence you know on how much we can get involved in doing a lot of other things so we'll, we'll have to wait to see what happens there but i have great confidence you know over the next